Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, a podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Brew, and today we have come to one of Greg's favorite stories in scripture, or so it would seem, because he tells this story and gives a fabulous lecture on it every year in, in chapel at school, right? This is like your Valentine's Day thing. Well, sometimes I do Ruth and Boaz. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I don't remember that one as much. You were but there then one I was year. Only, yeah. <laughs> but somehow I feel like I've heard this lecture at least four times. You probably have. <laughs> Even in that one year. Anyhow, we are talking, of course, about the story of Othniel and Oxa and Caleb's challenge to the young men of Israel. So this is in Joshua 15. Uh, would you like to start with reading the text or do you want to summarize? Yeah. Well, let's let's go ahead and read it, so we'll we'll have it out there. I'm actually going to back up a little before their story, so that we can remember a little bit about Caleb. This is verse 13. And unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh, he that is Joshua, gave a part among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord, to Joshua, even the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron. And Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, Shishai and Ahiman and Talmai, the children of Anak. These were giants. And he went up thence to the inhabitants of Deber, the name of Deber before with Kerjath Sefer, which seems to mean city of books. Hmm. And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kerjath Sefer and taketh it, to him will I give Oxa my daughter to wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it. And he gave him Aksa, his daughter, to wife. It came to pass as she came unto him that she moved him to ask of her father a field, and she lighted off her ass. And Caleb said unto her, What wouldest thou? Who answered, Give me a blessing, for thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. And thus far the story of Caleb, Aksa, and Othniel. Now, there actually is a little bit more about Othniel later, but we'll, we'll mention that if time permits or requires. A very simple story. It also appears in Judges chapter 1, more or less word for word. You have mentioned that I used to do this regularly as a chapel message. I think I remember the first time that I did it as a chapel message. And I, I asked the young ladies, this was probably mostly high school at that point, but the others may have been there, I don't remember what they thought of this deal and whether or not if their fathers were to put forward such a deal to the potential suitors in their lives, whether they would approve or not, whether they would go along with this or not. And I think the first time around, almost everybody, except maybe one young lady, everyone else said, no way, no, this is ridiculous. This is dumb. What's he doing? This is, this is completely unacceptable and blah, 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 so on. When I was done explaining the story, I asked them again, and I think almost everyone said, this would be a great deal. <laughs> Where do we sign up for this? Um, so they needed some extra perspective. On <laughs> no. So our this is what we're going to do today. We're going to try to understand what Caleb was doing, why it was a good idea, and why maybe... Christian dads shouldn't necessarily do exactly the same thing <laughs> today. For one thing, there are no cities of giants around, so that kind of complicates the problem here. But, you know, there, there was a time in uh, Western history, particularly the history of Western literature and fable and myth and all that, when it was not uncommon to tell stories about the king who promises his daughter to the knight, warrior, lord, whoever, who will slay the dragon or whatever, some whatever other problem is upon the kingdom. And, and there was a time when everyone kind of took that in stride. That seemed for, for nobility, which nobody really was, that seemed the kind of thing such folk might do, and it would be made for <laughs> good adventure stories. And then we get to the 50s, 60s, and 70s, actually even earlier, and we begin to get Disney films about princesses waiting for their prince to come. The prince who may or may not do anything at all to win them. There'd be something to Just go to win. Just shows up and sings a song over the wall. Yeah. Um, gives her a kiss when she's dead. Dances. 
with her until she loses a shoe. Um, uh, later on, we do get someone like Prince Eric who actually takes on a witch and runs a ship with a cross of course, on it. Into he wouldn't said witch. have had to take on the witch if the girl <laughs> hadn't made a deal with the witch uh, to yeah, begin make, with. Make a deal with the devil. Yeah, there's... Someday my prince will come. And I think too often Christian folk have um, bought into that in the name of Jesus. We tell our, our, our girls, God has someone just for you, and one day he will come. And you should be ready, getting ready for that day. Which is fine advice up to a point, but it kind of leaves big holes in the possibilities. I have known young women who have waited way into their 30s for Prince Charming to show up. And I know ladies, godly ladies, sweet, intelligent, attractive ladies, who are still waiting. The 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 naive, God has someone for you, and he will show up at the right time. You do not need to put yourself out there, visit other churches. You certainly don't need to do any kind of uh, online dating service because... Just trust God to bring someone to our church, although there are no young men here at the moment. And definitely don't make eye contact with any young men because that's flirting. That's flirting. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Uh, when the guy's that's actually ready, a sin. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, these young men will walk right across the room to your father. Tell you, tell her <laughs> that, tell him that he's interested in you. Would like to prove before himself. you've talked to him. Yes, yes, yeah. because that would be circumventing the chain of command. Otherwise. Yeah, we, we, we've we kind of got a little fussy and silly and have tried to put our incompetence sometimes on God's providence. Well, <laughs> yeah. God's, God's going to bring somebody. Well, he can, and I think we all know stories where he has. That's not the same thing as God promising that that's how he's going to do things. In the rest of our experience, those things that we want and need for body and soul. Yes, he tells us to pray, to pray for our daily bread. But as Luther says, God will not therefore make a chicken fly roasted into your mouth. <laughs> you, you actually have to do some work here and simple things like learning how to talk to a guy, walking across the room when he won't, getting your dad to walk across the room and say, come over and have lunch with us and talk to my... Oh, that's embarrassing. You know, a lot of things in life are embarrassing. Do you want to get married or not? And uh, a lot of what Disney has done for us, and I like Disney movies as far as they go. They're fun, usually. But trying to set them up as a, as a standard for how Christians ought to behave has some huge holes, including this, that getting married is always going to be surrounded with glowing romance that sets the world on fire. Now, some relationships do that way, particularly in the West where we've come to expect them and kind of wait on them. But there is nothing in Scripture anywhere that says, fall in love and marry the woman you love. What the Bible says is love the one you marry. And there are a lot of good reasons. For, well, particularly there are three, but there are some others. Uh, this is another question I ask my students now and then. What are the three best reasons for getting married? Or I will do it as a... As a multiple choice kind of thing. And among them, I will include mutual help, companionship, the one ought to have of another, uh, the propagation of species and protection from fornication. And when they see that, kids often will laugh out loud. Like, that's a reason for getting married? Blah. Yes. <laughs> yes. It it's actually, in the Book of Common Prayer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it's in the Book of Common Prayer because it's in the Bible. Right. <laughs> it's better to marry than to burn. We could also talk about money and inheritance and uh, security. And some of Jane Austen's characters were not completely out to lunch when they thought about such things. <laughs> but of course, the greatest reason to get married is to seek God's kingdom and God's righteousness. And that can involve lots and lots of things. So with that in mind, we're going we're gonna to look at this story and piece some things together. So first of all, Caleb. We know Caleb. He's Caleb of Caleb and Joshua. He's one of the two faithful spies who 40 years later, earlier, had gone into the promised land and brought back a good report and 
And even before Joshua piped up, Caleb was already there in front of everyone saying, we are well able to overcome. We should not rebel against the Lord. He will give us this good land. Yeah, these there are giants. Yeah, they're great old cities, but they will fall before us because God's on our side. And people wanted to kill him. Well, the children of Israel refused to listen to Joshua and Caleb, and God told them into one of the wilderness for 40 years until that generation dropped dead. But Caleb and Joshua promised that they would live and that they would see the promised land. So jo Caleb has had 40 years to think about giants and what needs to happen to giants and how a man who believes God and trusts God's promises can take down giants. And when he comes into the land, one of the it's not included here, although we get the tail end of it. He comes straight to Joshua and says, give me Hebron. Hebron is where the giants were. The giants they were so terrified of 40 years ago. I want to take them on. And, you know, so he's probably 80-something at this point. But uh, he, he wants to take giants on. And he does. And he, he expels them from Hebron, kills them, sends them packing. And then he moves toward a nearby city, Kerjath Sefer which seems to have been a cultural city, since this name means city of books. So that's that's significant to taking down the pagan presence of Canaan. You probably want to get rid of their books, not because they're books, but because they reflect a pagan worldview you don't need your people buying into. But rather than taking himself, which he apparently would be well able to have done, he publishes a decree, a proclamation. Whoever takes this city can marry my daughter. Now, this is where the feminists go wild. What How in the world is he, he doing? How his daughter like a prize? Yeah, I'm not some prize to be worn, uh, to be won. I'm, insert Jasmine here. <laughs> but, but there's some things we need to understand about the whole biblical context. The most important is the Bible never requires any woman to marry a man apart from her own consent. Now, the Bible encourages her to listen to her father and mother and the advice of those who are older and wiser, but to force a woman into another into a man's bed without her consent, that's called rape. And the Bible is absolutely opposed to that. Uh, we have the, the, the one place where this comes to the fore is when um, Isaac's servant or Abraham's servant, uh, Eben, Eliezer, sorry, has gone and has found Rebecca and wants to leave right away. And her family says, well, let us ask the maiden, do you want to go with this man? And here we have a situation where apparently even God himself has spoken as far as they, they can tell. And, and, and in the end, they admit, and yet they will not send her without her permission. Now, they probably had some other agendas going on as well. And yet, nonetheless, the one that obviously was everyone's defense was, she's got to agree to this. And of course she does, having never met Isaac. That'd be another love story to talk about. So when, when we come to this, we, we have to understand and assume that Caleb's already talked this over with Oxa. So, and, and Oxa's okay with this. And, and now we need to talk about why this would be. Uh, what is it? What, what is it in this deal? that Oxa says, well, that sounds like a good deal. I'll count me in. Uh, and so you you two feel free to, to jump in. You've, you've heard this thing before and can come up with your own ideas as well. It, it is possible, in fact, probable that she knew who the front runner was. <laughs> now, why all this was necessary, we're not told. He probably didn't have a dowry. That's We, we see that later with, for instance, David. But... Uh, Maybe he just needed some pushing. Oftentimes, guys are a little slow and a little lame or don't know if the girl will accept them or, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, you this is think... Caleb's daughter we're talking about. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Caleb's you don't just daughter. go up to Caleb and ask, hey, yes. can I date your daughter? Yeah. I don't think so. Her? Me? <laughs> um well, and in that light, you can think of David when David was encouraged by the king's counselors. Oh, go be the king's son. Is it a light thing to be the king's son-in-law? I am a poor man and lightly esteemed in Israel. Oh, eh, he's got no money in the, in the family. Name. Uh, king, Saul, I got a problem here. So yeah, so th there's, there's the thing. Caleb's lighting a fire under, whether it's specifically Othniel or whether there are perhaps some others, maybe Othniel 
is going to. I mean, you, you you could write stories on this. He's got a best friend whom he really loves, who's also interested in oxide. He's going to back <laughs> off and let his friend have her. You know, stupid things that people do all the time. <laughs> So for some reason, Caleb and Ox agree, this is the best way to get what we want. What does she want? She wants a godly husband who's a whole lot like dad, because notice what the task is. Take out a city of giants, just like dad did. Okay. As you say, this is Caleb. Who's going to dare to say, I'm as godly a man as Caleb? No one's going to do that. But when you reduce it down to one task. Concrete. Make it concrete. <laughs> make, make it concrete. Do this. Maybe that'll get some action. Uh, and here are some of the things that, that would fall out. Obviously, even, even to take this up, the man's got to be physically brave. He's Whether or not, it's not completely clear whether or not there are still giants there, but they are at least allies of the giants. And there's some mean, nasty, big baddies there. Uh, in, and there may be giants. Uh, the man who takes on the city, he's going to have to be physically brave. And he's going to have to have some military prowess. He's going to have to be good with a sword or a bow or spear or something. And, and be physically strong and, and not afraid to hazard his life to accomplish this. But that's not nearly enough because lots of people are brave warriors. These are giants. These, these are, this is Canaan. This is the promised land. The promised land is acquired by faith. Mm -hmm. So you can have all of the battle readiness in the world and fail in this job. You need to be trusting God. You need to be willing to put your life on the line for the kingdom of God's sake because you believe God's promise that this can happen. And it doesn't matter how much you love the girl or how brave you are or what your superpower is. If you don't trust Yahweh, if you do not believe the promise of Messiah, this is going to fall flat real fast. So Ox is looking for a godly man who is moved by faith, not just has faith and sits in his little corner exercising his faith in his prayer <laughs> closet. He's, Living a contemplative life. Yes, he's not. She's not going to get that. She's going to get someone worthy of the Hebrews eleven Hall of Heroes. People who, because of their faith, did some kind of weird and sometimes challenging and dangerous stuff. Uh, but that said, you don't take a city on your own, even with God's blessing. Uh, I am not immediately thinking of any, thinking of any warrior who. By himself, not even Samson, really, who took out an entire city by himself. You need friends. You need battle companions. Mm -hmm. And so you go to your friends, and, and you better have some good ones, and they better be godly men, because if they're a bunch of reprobates, however godly you are, God's not going to honor this. We've seen before what happens when you start um, letting the, uh, the wolves run the uh, battle campaign. It, it doesn't go well. So you got to have this guy's got to have some godly friends, and he's going to go to them and say, I, I, "I want to be more active in this conquest of Canaan thing." Okay, well that's good. We we're, we're with you there, and I want to take out that city. Ooh, that's your no, a pretty big city. Yeah, see, because there's Oxa, but Oxa. See, if I take it, I get to marry her. Now, what are the guys going to say here? Like. Oh, somebody's in love. Ha -ha. <laughs> He's got a crush. He's got Othniel a crush. and Oxos in the tree. <laughs> <-I> anyway. <laughs> um, or are they going to say, look at each other and say, huh? All right, when do we go? Uh, that, 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 this is a good deal. Um, we're with you. We'll, when you're, you know, one of the things that you find out, and I'm guessing that you each have found out in time, when you decide to marry and you go to your friends, what you want your friends to be is supportive, not come back with, you're going to marry that lame, that, you know, start <laughs> filling in adjectives here. When I had proposed to, I don't know if I proposed to her, I must have at this point. One of her best friends said, no, he, basically, you can do better than that. He's too old and other things that disqualified him completely. You, you can do a lot better. On my side, I was told afterwards, I didn't know at the time, but I was told afterwards, 
that some of my, I don't even know which friends, but some friends, friends from up north, uh, wanted to come and talk me out of this. <laughs> and fortunately, our friend David Farshman said, no. <laughs> Thank you, David, if you're listening. Because uh, that kind of complicated things no end. Uh, you, you really don't want that. You want, and you don't want your friends just humoring you. Okay, well, he's made up his mind. Right. Let us all smile. That is Ray. also a danger. <laughs> yeah. You want your friends to honestly be able to say, that is a great choice. She's, you know, a little above your league, but okay, you got her. Good move there. <laughs> um, and and so this is what Ox is going to get. She's going to get her, her, her true love is going to have a bunch of godly guys as friends who themselves are warriors, who themselves are moved by faith, and who think that she's worth this, at least for Othniel, if not for themselves. They, they may not want to fight for her. But they think that she and Othniel are a great match, and they're willing to put their lives on the line to support this wedding. Now, think about that. That, that means five, friendship ten, means a lot after the wedding, too. After the wedding, because they put their lives yeah. on the line and they see Othniel going a little cold or careless in his relationship. They're going to be in his face. Hey, hey <laughs> we, uh, you remember we fought White, giants for this. Yeah, we fought giants for this. You, you remember um, White Christmas? This is, this is a real mm -hmm. detour. Uh, Danny <laughs> Kaye's character is always rubbing the, the, the place where he got oh, injured saving yes he broke his arm yeah. saving being crosby's character's life and so every time something because it's well you know it's not like i ever did anything for it they're going to be <laughs> pulling that kind of routine or probably even more forcibly uh we risk our lives for you and for this girl for this marriage you're not pulling this garbage you get back in there and you make up to her and you make this thing work and 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 Oxa will understand this. Oh, these are the kind of I'm not just getting a husband. I'm getting a husband within a community of supportive friends who will help us make our marriage work. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good deal. Now he also is going to have to have some smarts because this is a city, and that requires some strategy and tactics. It probably means going and talking to some older guys who have a little bit of experience and figuring this out because. Although he's going to have help, ultimately the final battle plan, the final call is his. He's got to be smart enough to know his limitations, but also smart enough to come up with a plan and implement it and make it work and, and delegate. Okay, you're taking this gate. You're going up this wall. And if he doesn't, if he's just a, a stupid lout, then again, this is not going to work very well. Yeah, one thing that I think is notable for fathers is that Caleb hasn't asked any task that he hasn't demonstrated mm. himself willing to perform, willing and able. I think uh, sometimes with the best of intentions, fathers can be very overprotective and demand things of their daughter's suitors that they could never fulfill. <laughs> and they, there's a da danger of being a parental Pharisee, of laying a burden that you would not lift a finger to lift yourself. Or that you still don't do. Uh, mm -hmm. My brother-in-law was uh, interested in a young lady who seemed to be a pretty marvelous young lady, but the father just sat hurdle after hurdle after hurdle until finally uh, the elder stepped in and, and but they even they weren't very helpful. But yeah, he's just kind of like that. It sounded and in in, in nothing happened. They, they eventually went their separate ways because dad was just pretty much determined uh, that this was not a way of finding her a suitor or a husband, but a way of keeping her from ever having one. Mm -hmm. And so not only is there the danger of being pharisaical about it, there's also the danger of putting up so many roadblocks that, that nobody nobody's going to want the girl. And it's uh, not protection at that point. It's no, not for it the isn't. daughter's good to be single for her whole life. No, it, it is not. I uh, apparently I have a reputation for being scary, <laughs> and yet I I don't think that any of the young men who hang around my daughters uh, have been that scared. I haven't yet got well. That's no, I take that back. Actually, I did get it once. Didn't didn't, <laughs> didn't pan out. But um, for young men out there, 
be men. Go talk to dad <laughs> when it's time. Dad, don't play the ogre on purpose. There's a time and a place. <laughs> You're scary for that. enough just by virtue of being yeah, dead. <laughs> generally, you are, and you know your goal. One hopes is to find your daughter a husband, not to keep her from getting one. And so Caleb, no doubt, looked around and he picked what he thought was doable. He did not say, go devise the first textbook on physics, go paint the Mona Lisa, go compose a piano concerto and orchestrate it with flute and drum. You could, there was none of that. Uh, he, he put something forward that was part of what was going on at the time, conquering Canaan something that these young men should have been up for, at least at some level, and apparently something he knew that Othniel and perhaps others were capable of doing. It just it just needed to happen. There needed to be some action. And, and here's the thing that we haven't said, but it, it's, it's there. The man who does this is almost certainly going to love her. Mm -hmm. There were other cities you could take. There are other battles you could have fought. This one was particularly tricky and dangerous. And the thing that would have moved young men to take it on would be the girl herself. Othniel must have loved Aksa quite a bit because he's risking not only his own life, he's risking the life of his best friends. That's huge. Mm -hmm. Now, I, the, I may have forgotten something, but one of the final things here is that when this is over and when he has taken the city and when they're married, her husband is going to be rich. <laughs> um, owns a city. Owns a city. More reward than you can possibly imagine. <laughs> I um, don't know. I can imagine quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and yet the amazing thing here is that both uh, Othniel and Oxa and Caleb turned their cities into Levitical cities. They surrendered them back to become cities of pastors, mm -hmm. to become cultural cities for the kingdom of God over against what they had been in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, Hebron had its roots, so it went back to Abraham and Sarah. Now it's going to be remembered as a place where God's Levites and his priests hang out and study the law and minister. And Kijah Sefer, which will now be called Deber, uh, is going to be the same kind of thing. And while they may have retained the, the fields and the suburbs for themselves, they they gave it up. They gave up control, exclusive control of the city for the kingdom of God. That was more important to them. And then there's that last little bit that actually makes up most of the story because the I mean the story is Othniel the son of Kenaz and brother of Caleb took it and he gave him <laughs> Oxa his daughter to wife. That's one verse. How did he take it? Yeah, <laughs> we, there's a lot we would like to know there, and when we get to heaven, we could ask. We get something else happening. It came to pass as she came unto him that she moved him to ask of her father a field. There seem to be two different requests. One, she gets Othniel to ask for land. Well, Caleb's in a position. Caleb controls a lot of property already, having taken Hebrew in the area surrounding it. And she's she's active here. She is not the passive little... Uh, shrinking violet waiting for her big man to do everything. Okay, dear, now that you've done that, good job, by the way, we need some more land. We need some fields. So go talk to my dad. Oh, can't you do it? Because you're the man. It's your job. So go do as I say. And go, <laughs> the husband go. is the head and the woman is the neck. She some, turns the head. <laughs> At least sometimes she gives profound wisdom. She moves him <laughs> to ask her father the field. But it doesn't end it. So having done that, he does his part. But then she goes to Caleb on a donkey. Interesting um, little tidbit there. And Caleb okay. sees her coming and says, well, basically, well, what do you want? What, what is thou? She says, "You, I, I want a blessing from you. You've given me a Southland, presumably the field in question. Give me also springs of water. Because if you don't have control and access to the springs and can't funnel them off, channel them off, dig new riverbeds and such, you may not be able to water that precious field you got. You may just got a several hundred acres of desert. 
So Here she in California, went, we understand the importance of water rights. <laughs> we do. Mm. And he agrees. He gave her the upper springs and the other springs. He, he doesn't just give her one set of springs. He gives her two sets. Now, something that's not mentioned here, presumably Caleb had sons. They're getting kind of cut out in this deal. Because here's the daughter who, together with her husband, her new husband, are making a great team. And Caleb is um, backing this, this deal. Uh, he's, he's giving assets that normally would probably have gone to her brothers. But she's there. She's got a plan. And it's very clear from what follows in the rest of Scripture that her priorities are those of the kingdom of God. Well, sons... <laughs> Go kill some giants someplace and get your own springs. Your sister's <laughs> already on top of this one. There, I said earlier, there is one other thing because um, Othniel shows up again. The story's retold in Judges, almost verbatim, I, th I think. Uh, but then we have a little bit more about Othniel. I mean, it's it's uh, it's an honor to get your your story told twice in, in the Bible. But then this is what happens. In the first generation, God's people begin to defect again and go after idols. And verse 8 of chapter 3, Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rithathayim, king of Mesopotamia. The children of Israel served Cushan Rithathayim uh, eight years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Cusheth with the Thayim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed against Cusheth with the Thayim, and the land had rest forty years. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. So, when Israel defected and God sent a conqueror, this Mesopotamian or Babylonian or Syrian king, Aram Nehraim, so I guess Syrian, he oppresses Israel for eight years. And this is one of those rare times when Israel, it only takes eight years for them to get this one. Oh, we should repent. And they do. <laughs> and when God looks around for a deliverer, there's Othniel. And he's clothed with the Spirit of God. He goes out, he judges Israel. It's the first of the judges after Joshua's death. And he uh, proves a great warrior, rescuing, saving God's people from their temporal oppressors and establishing peace in the land for 40 years, um, not unlike uh, David and Solomon. So we can step back for this just a second. And we're, we're all fond of biblical theology and biblical imagery. We have, a, we have an anointed judge who defeats God's enemy and brings rest to God's people. Can we say type of Christ? <laughs> that part's not hard. But now we look back and say, oh, and his first thing, the first thing he did was to win a bride. Mm -hmm. A bride who then moves him to ask for land and herself beseeches the father for living water. So very solid images of Christ, and thus not only because of the character of his marriage, but particularly because of its Christological significance, uh, we get the story twice. So we come we come back to should Christian fathers set such tests? Well, we don't got no giants. We don't have a temporal promised land. Uh, and right now, most of the battles that we need to fight don't involve swords or even AK-47s. But the idea of a daughter and a father agreeing on what's important in her spouse is always scriptural. Mm. And a father and a daughter trusting each other enough to listen, to help, to not get in the way, either direction. These are huge things, and these are timeless things. As I said when I first presented this at chapel 20-some-odd years ago, uh, the young ladies 
shifted from no, never to sign me up. I get <laughs> the one thing I said, you know, there is one thing that she wasn't guaranteed of, unless, of course, she knew for sure who was going to win. Uh, there's no description. There's no guarantee that he would be good looking. <laughs> or whatever standard young ladies, play. I, I'm always told, oh, girls don't care about the looks. <laughs> I don't, I, I, I'm not a girl. Don't know. Don't know how that works. <laughs> um, you know, no he's cute, and, cute and sensitive and have a nice looking backside. It's more or less what I do. <laughs> um, I, I don't know such things. Uh, but... Uh, there are elements of character that I've seen as my own daughters have looked over young men and some of my former female students have shared their concerns. Honesty, integrity, kindness, purity, hard work ethic, knowing that he will listen and that he will care about what you're saying, that he will provide for you. I know this is a world of two incomes now, but uh, I don't think anybody wants a husband who's going to sit in the basement and play video games while the wife goes out and maintains a job. And 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 by the way, for the record, and after the marriage, I I saw situations where young men, having achieved the girl, having won her, having married her, then went into the basement to play or whatever mm -hmm. to play video games and left her alone at night, night after night. This is unconscionable. This is ridiculous. This is not the character of a godly husband. So there are things that, and Emily, feel free to jump in any place here. Uh, there are things that a godly woman should want. And women, I know, are in the habit of making lists. I know this because they tell me this. <laughs> uh, and sometimes those lists are very wise, and sometimes they're not. I know one young lady whose name you would probably recognize if, if I said it, but I won't who uh, had a very particular issue. She was very well educated, uh, had her own view of what a, someone who would be a good husband for her would be like. And she married someone, she said in the end, who met none of the things that I wanted, but was everything that I needed. Hmm. And that's, hmm. that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. What she found was a godly husband who loved her and would lay down his life for her. And that's what's going on with Othniel. He loves her. And gives himself for her, like Jesus. And uh, when your wife can look at you and say, "You remind me of Jesus," that's terrifying, and yet in some ways a little comforting. Of course, it's terrifying. It okay. So now I have to live up to that for the rest <laughs> of my life. <sighs> before Holy estate not to be entered lightly. Yeah, before I was married, I. I knew the text that uh, we should love our wives and, and, and lay down our lives for our wife as, as Jesus did for the church. And I knew that would happen now and then. What I did not understand was that is a daily dying to self. That's not something you do now and then. That's something you get up and you do every day. This is what God calls us to. And we're not going to be perfect because we're sinners. And this is why marriages have to be founded on faith in Jesus, not mm -hmm. on romantic love. But romantic love will come. In fact, romantic love is commanded. There are things in Proverbs, like Solomon and in Ecclesiastes. Solomon should know. He wrote all three of those books uh, that involve <laughs> physical excitement over the one you love. And it's not simply as, a, well, you may get this someday. It's something that's commanded, but it's commanded the one you marry. So it's something you work on. It's something that both of, both parties work on. Yeah. And it's not a given the the excitement you feel when you first come to the altar is not guaranteed to continue. What will happen is God will build something much deeper and stronger, and it may take some time, depending on circumstances. And the more you give yourself completely to Jesus, the easier and the less time it will take. But it is it is an active part of our sanctification. It's not a sacrament, as Rome would have it. <laughs> But it puts you through a lot that sends you back to Jesus again and again. Lord willing, sends you back together mm -hmm. to Jesus. And that builds the love and the romance. Other thoughts, either of you or both of you? That just kind of reminds me, I think I've mentioned this, this exact quote before. There's a female comedian who talks about like 
the 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 ways that men and women both start to feel attraction for the people that they you know are end end up dating or getting married to, and it's like you will a the first one is like you will never hear a man be honest like he could be marrying a gargoyle and you will never hear him be like oh jessica <gasps> yeah sorry i was just thinking about her smile <laughs> you're never gonna hear it it's like it's always like she is the light of my life she is beautiful she is my queen the north star the greatest beauty in the world <laughs> and meanwhile women will just be blatantly honest and they're like oh tom yeah he's no brad pitt (laughs) (laughs) and todd will be the first guy to be like i'm not an attractive man (laughs) (laughs) well a professor of mine once mentioned that women don't don't care about physical attractiveness they care about completely superficial things like whether or not you respect them. <laughs> 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 and there's there's an element of truth to that. Makes so, sense, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Brad Pitt, really. <laughs> 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 My girls have very different tastes. Brad Pitt is not on their radar at all. Yeah, I'm on the same page with them. <laughs> <laughs> Colin, what, is Colin Firth or... <laughs> uh, let's not go down this road. <laughs> all right, well then... <laughs> Let's uh, let's wrap up with some recommendations. Mm. Um, I actually have a marriage-related recommendation. All right, so you go first. I'll, then. I'll jump in. Uh, I recommend lamp shopping with your husband or wife. Um, <laughs> this, there's a story behind this. The story is that about four years ago, just before David and I were married, we went lamp shopping, and it almost led to the cancellation of our wedding. <laughs> <laughs> um. Not that the lamp itself was the problem, but the shopping and the communication during the shopping brought a lot of issues to the surface that we needed to deal with. Mm. I don't want to take too much time to go into all the details. (laughs) Um, But yeah, we we went to counseling and we still got married. (laughs) We still have the lamp that was assigned to us to buy. (laughs) That was our homework from that counseling session was, all right, now you guys have to go buy a lamp. And so we did. And now we have that lamp and it's, it's not the most attractive lamp in the world. It's from Ikea. It cost about $30. Um, but we are never getting rid of that lamp because it is a <laughs> lamp that almost destroyed our marriage. And yet we we, we overcame we by the grace of God. Uh, you prevailed. But as, as or I, it was the lamp that salvaged your real marriage and got you past <laughs> superficialities. Oh, mm, that's, that's an alternative take. <laughs> um, Just saying. <laughs> well we we went lamp shopping again uh this week just a couple of days ago and had 10,000 times better of a time after four oh, years good. of practice <laughs> of communicating and uh sharing tastes and dreams as well as practical concerns that had been an issue as I'm like look it's pretty and David would list all the pros and cons because to him this is a communication thing of we both lay all our cards on the table and agree on a lamp and i should just feel like i'm being squashed because everything i think is pretty has a list of cons Um, (laughs) but yeah so we we have through the last four years really come to enjoy designing things together and sharing tastes being very clear when we are talking about ideals versus realities Um, and it's it's a good time we have a wonderful lamp that i like very much as a result of this weekend. Two wonderful lamps, actually. We, we doubled down. So <laughs> I recommend purchasing lamps with your husband or wife. Brian, you, you got go. anything? Um, yes, I think I'm going to recommend a film. Uh, or or is it, it's more like anti-recommending a film. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you recommend not watching it? <laughs> no, here's the thing. I recommend watching it with many caveats. Oh, um, <laughs> no. And I don't think any of the reasons for watching it are, you will necessarily enjoy this. Uh, it, so there's a uh, movie that just came out. I was actually very excited about it. 
um, before I went into the theaters and actually watched it. Uh, it is a film by David Lowry. It's an adaptation of a Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Ooh. I heard about this. It is I'm very, very interested to hear your thoughts. I can give you more thoughts when we're done recording, but the <laughs> short and skinny of it is it is a very art house art film take on what should be a straightforward mythical retelling. And it makes very little sense. There's very little context. There's little setup or explanation or here's what's going on or who uh, the, the, here's who these people are and why you should care about them. It's just like, here, here's a story and some cool shots. The best I can say for it is it has really fantastic cinematography. Like, <laughs> it is it is a gorgeous film about 80% of the time, which is a higher percentage than I can say for a lot of movies that are intended to be that way. Um, but it's very, very odd. There's like, it's just, I don't know. I, I feel like you need to be a classicist in some sense to adapt something that is classic. <laughs> How and am I just appreciate it as a story? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, Apparently that makes you a classicist the these days. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> so so it, 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 my, my main complaint with it is it does the standard. It also does the thing in the conclusion that I hate, hate, hate about modernist and postmodernist <laughs> no storytelling. Oh, don't worry. Is okay. Is that it? I mean, th maybe this is a spoiler, and you'll think I've ruined the film for you. But nonetheless, <laughs> don't we all know the story? We all do. But the, the uh, thing our, is, our, that our he... listeners may not, and we need to oh, allow let's, them let's, the let's... pleasure of reading it. I will describe the, the the kind of storytelling foible that I dislike in as vague a terms as possible, <laughs> which is that you will see the narrative arc going like this. And right before the climax, it'll just be like, and the story's done. You're you're done. You gotta you gotta figure out what it means. Oh good luck. Yeah, that's gross. I read a novel like that last year. I hate it. I sold it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it's just not my favorite. Huh. So what I heard about the movie from the one other person that I've heard talk about it was that it was a perfect articulation of where we are in a post Christian world. Um, which I don't understand how you can tell that story and do that because the entire story is predicated on this test of chastity and this value of chastity. And I don't, I don't know how it does these two things. <laughs> the things you just described were sort of waste paper basketed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In other words, rewrite the text. Yeah, more or less. So as to rewrite the subtext and um, and then remove. In other the words, context. pick up some, pick up, yeah, pick up some images and make your own story out of them. That's about. That's pretty postmodern. That's very post-Christian. Yeah. I don't know if they uh, if they wanted it to say that, but it does. I guess mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a good description. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's my anti recommendation. As far as my positive recommendation. Joss Whedon did a similar thing, but it was actually good. And that was he he did a film version that was kind of modern setting sort of of Much Ado About Nothing. And it's Yes, quite good. I was just thinking of this for this exact reason. <laughs> it's very good. Uh, we yeah. just watched it this past weekend. And it was just like, yeah, you did good, Joss. You got mm -hmm. all these fun people, all these fun actors together. And you just you filmed a version of Much Ado About Nothing over... A long weekend, and it, yeah. that, it's good. <laughs> okay, so there are three things about this version of Much Ado About Nothing that I think are absolutely stellar. The first is that they kept the Shakespearean language. Yes. They didn't try to improve on Shakespeare, which is a stupid thing to do. Um, second, again, it's all in a weekend at this one house. I think it's Joss Whedon's house, It's right? Joss Whedon's so house. So it's like, you can tell someone actually lives here. Like, it's... It's just a house, man. It's it's fantastic. And it's a beautiful house, but it's not a movie set. It's very realistic. Like you can imagine someone wealthy hosting a lot of people at this house for the weekend, because that's exactly what he did. Um, and thirdly, you will notice in every scene there 
are an abundance of wine glasses in various states of fullness. <laughs> and it makes the story make a lot more sense, if we're honest. <laughs> I, I will add a fourth to that list, which is that for some of the the large group scenes, you can tell that Joss was just like, hey, uh, don't worry. It's just a regular party. Do whatever you're going to do. But there's going to be a film crew here, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Is this the one with David Tennant? No, oh, no, no, it's not. That is okay, another good. one that's fun. This is okay. th this has all the the Whedon staple actors. Yeah. It's got. Oh, is this with um, Nathan yeah. Fillion as Dogberry? Nathan Barry. Fillion, yeah. Oh, he's okay. Dogberry, okay. which is an, right. just incredible. Yeah, yeah, he's got to um, be better than Michael Keaton. <laughs> Michael Keaton okay. has his own charm that is unique in the world <laughs> of Shakespeare and adaptations. But yes. <laughs> All right. Well, my recommendation is I recommend pulling weeds. <laughs> this, this Fighting the fall. Yeah, this presupposes that you have a garden or something like that, maybe a yard. <laughs> uh, now's the time to pull the weeds. And if you do a little bit every weekend, the weeds get pulled and your yard looks better and it's ready for planting things. And a couple hours out in the, out in the hot sun, California, it's been around um, 102 or so. But, you know, shade and sitting on top. And it's, it, it, it is the philosophy of slow but city keeps your house from turning into something really gross and scroungy. Mm -hmm. So if, whether it applies to, you know, my, my parents came out of the Depression and their attitude toward things was make it work, but don't ever spend really much money on it. And put it off if you can. I think I got the worst of that and interpreted it as worst as possible for many years. And now I'm learning, no, let's pull the weeds now, a little at a time. Let's do this repair now. Not too long ago, we spent $1,000 just on plumbing. And most mm -hmm. of it was, dear plumber friend, uh, his daughter, been one of my students, would you come and all of these uh, faucets that are getting old and one day will break and there will be no way of fixing them first oh yeah fix them but first you're going to have to fix the cutoff valve so you actually can turn <laughs> the water off in our house yeah it was, it was just a whole bunch of real little things but it was that stay on top of things keep things fixed don't wait until everything mounts up and it's going to cost you ten thousand dollars to fix things pull the weeds now and there are applications to marriage too um, mm -hmm. The little one of my my wife's favorite lines: "The little foxes that spoil the vines." <laughs> Go after little foxes with sniper rifles before they become <laughs> great big dire wolves and take out your throat. Oh no! So I was thinking <laughs> of the little prince and his lesson of the baobab trees, where you have to pull them up where they're small before they take over your whole planet. Mm. Um, and the little fox is a much more friendly and cuddly thing in that situation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, don't shoot. The little prince's friend fox with your sniper okay, rifle. Okay, okay. Foxes, foxes that have been disciplined can live, but little foxes that destroy vines must be taken out by the roots. Or something like that. There you go. <laughs> I don't think foxes have roots. Maybe that's just I me. Mean, I, I studied one biology textbook, so I'm clearly an expert. <laughs> just a hunch there. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my dearly beloved, lawfully wedded husband. And uh, Lampfire. And Lampfire. He has been chased <laughs> in lamps when I let him express it. <laughs> uh, thanks also to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in, and we're always happy to hear from you. You can email us at haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. Thank you also to our financial supporters. We appreciate you quite a bit. If you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Check out our Facebook page, YouTube, Rumble. We're all over the place. We're not on Twitter because that's a terrible place to be. But we're in good places. <laughs> I mean, is YouTube really better? I don't know. At least we're there. You can listen to us. And invite friends to listen. Invite friends to listen. Yes. That is the nice thing about YouTube is it's very shareable. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you next week. <laughs>